Question good. Go ahead. Yeah, as you know, New Hampshire is a border state. Uh, we have our friendly neighbors to the north, yes. Canada. And generally every summer, uh, the Border Patrol likes to set up on Interstate 93, a good 60, 70 miles from the border crossing and stop every car traveling south. Yep. Uh, thoughts on those internal border checkpoints? They are the natural conclusion of the increasingly Orwellian police and surveillance state that has to be created in order to enforce a ridiculous set of immigration controls. Let's be very clear about something. One of the reasons this country even exists, one of the reasons stated in the Declaration of Independence for why the founders took up arms against the British king was because he was limiting immigration into the country. It is actually one of the founding statements of the U.S. of, of the existence of the United States of America is that government shouldn't be limiting or stopping people coming here for peaceful reasons. For the first hundred years that the U.S. existed, there were effectively no controls at the federal level on immigration at all. And for another 50 or 60 years after that, we had the Ellis Island time, uh, the Ellis Island period, where there were very few restrictions on immigration. In fact, the entire concept of uh, immigration controls, that the, that the border should be used as something other than a delineation of political boundaries and a line that foreign arm, armies and, 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 and weapons aren't allowed to cross uh, be, is something that happened during the Cold War. That's a, that's a post-World War II phenomenon, and it has not served us well. It has led, it has been often a justification for the government to violate your rights, not just your right to host, hire, or house whomever you want on your property, but your right to get a job without having to submit your information to a federal database. Or, in many states, get a car, or get a loan, or get sign a new lease, or rent your home out, or uh, get utilities put in your name, or, or, or many other things, having to go through a federal database before you can do any of that. Of course, if they find anything else there, they can give you a hard time about it. This is, and like you mentioned, the, the 50 to 60 mile a swap inside of any uh, border or, or shoreline, which pretty much means most of where 80, 90% of Americans live, the Border Patrol, the federal government, claims the authority to set up checkpoints and detain you uh, briefly without any warrant or stated reason just because they want to. All of that is a natural conclusion of those bad policies, of those bad immigration control policies. What the Libertarian Party believes is that if there are to be any kind of controls, they should be very minimal and only for the protection of the public. So we believe what, what Joe and I are pushing for is something closer to the Ellis Island style program. People come, they give their name, they give their uh, nation of origin where they're coming from, they are checked for communicable diseases. If they have a communicable disease, they're quarantined for whatever period of time uh, they need to be quarantined for for that disease. If they're not, they're free to move about the cabin because they're here for peaceful reasons. They have a presumption of innocence just like any other any other person here. They have a constitutional right to that. And we have seen in the past what that leads to. More and more people coming here from around the world. Most of us are the descendants of people who came here for entirely peaceful reasons in the last 150 or so years. I know I am. And we have we and our ancestors enriched this country, made it more prosperous, made it more diverse. All of the slurs that were used against my great-grandparents when they were coming here, that they would bring crime and disease and their filthy foreign religions are the same justifications being used now for either, even, even greater controls. And thank God those controls weren't in place then, or I wouldn't be here because my great-grandparents would, would not have qualified to come here. All of that needs to end. We need to go back to, at the very least, an Ellis Island style. We need to make it, uh, if we are the land of the free, then we need to be a place where people can freely come here for peaceful reasons. Hey, how are you doing? How would you guys feel about putting us back on the gold standard? So I think it should be left up to the free market. Uh, I think that the government has done a pretty good job of botching up our currency. Uh, and I think that uh, the idea of giving them a new standard by which they can continue botching it. Here's the problem with the gold standard. Are we talking Bretton Woods, where the government decides what the per ounce value of, uh, or how many ounces a dollar is, which is just a new way of fixing the currency? Uh, are we talking about fixing it directly to the market value of gold? 
uh, which then has limitations because if there's no new if there's no new gold being found now there's no it, it, you can't print out it, it reduces the ability to create new value uh, through currency. Uh, there, there's a lot of limitations there with that. The best thing that we can do is take it out of the hands of the government. In the time that the government has had control of your currency with the Federal Reserve, it has lost 98 cents on the dollar of its value. Let me say that a different way. Imagine if your money was worth 50 times what it's worth right now. That's how much you have been robbed by the Federal Reserve. In my mind, the government has a vested interest in your currency losing value over time because their debts lose value over time as a result of it. And if it makes your cost of living continue to skyrocket out of control, oh well, eventually you'll just end up on the welfare state or on subsidies, and that'll make you even more reliant on them. What a terrible uh, turn of events for them, right? So instead, if we hand it to the free market, so that now instead of having a monopoly controlling currency, you have competing providers who compete to provide you with the best value. Now, the people providing you with currency, whether it's cryptocurrency or some other form of currency, now they have a vested interest in your money gaining value over time. Because if it doesn't, or if it doesn't gain as much value as one of its competitors, they lose your business. It turns out if someone can't hold a gun to your head and make you use their business, they actually have to provide you with value. So whether it's gold standard, whether it's cryptocurrency, probably a whole combination of things that people can choose from, we, we, we believe we should leave that up to the market. But it well, starts with auditing and ending the Federal Reserve. Why use the gold standard when we can just use gold? Just use gold. One, you talk gold. Is this made of gold? That is gold. This is a dollar of gold. <laughs> and you too can give me a slice of gold <laughs> to help fund this campaign. I'm not sure how we report that to the FEC, but I will still accept it. We'll figure it out later. Thank you, Justin. It's a dollar. Any other questions? Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I saw you first, but then Go you ahead. and then, and then you. First. Sorry, sorry. Um, Yeah, absolutely. So here's what we've seen when the government has had control of, of, of environmental issues. The government steps in and says, we'll fix this problem. Yay. And then what they do is they uh, introduce regulations. Those regulations are often written by the largest, biggest, most polluting companies out there. Those regulations, surprisingly, uh, result in a lot of small and medium sized businesses going out of business because those regulations make it uh, cost prohibitive for them to even be in business anymore. Those weren't the companies that were doing massive pollution or massive contribution to climate change. They, they were just companies doing business. Now they're not. So now you only have the large, most polluting, uh, and most often negligent uh, competitors that are left. So when they put out massive amounts of greenhouse gases or when they engage in an oil leak or when they dump uh, uh, you know, countless amounts of, of sludge into rivers and streams and lakes, the federal government says, and it says, we'll fix this. They give them a, a slap on the wrist fine, hundreds of millions of dollars, couple billions of dollars for countless hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars in, prop in, in measurable property damage, not to mention the long lasting ill effects afterwards that could happen as a result of health effects and, and environmental effects and so forth. They give them a tiny slap on the wrist. Slap on the wrist, you actually feel a slap on the wrist more than they feel what they get fined for. Uh, and then, they protect them against lawsuits from you, their victims. Then what they do is they make you pay for the cleanup. They externalize the cost of that cleanup, which is more than they find those companies to you, which incentivizes them to continue doing that because it costs less to pay the fine than to clean it up or to have had the systems in place to not have that happen in the first place. It incentivizes pollution. That is what the federal environmental policy has done with these regulations and this indemnification and externalization of the cost. So here's our plan. Get the government out of it. Allow you to sue polluters or anyone else that does damage to your property. The justification for protecting them from lawsuits has been, you can't do that. It'll put them out of business. Good. If they have done trillions of dollars in damage, if they have ruined the lives of countless people who end up with cancer and other health effects, if they've done measurable damage to our environment that we all have to share, good, go out of business, lose everything, be penniless, and let that be a reminder to anyone else who would do it. More importantly, they're not gonna go out of business because they're not gonna do it in the first place. They're going to self-regulate so that they don't lose everything and become penniless and homeless as a result of the lawsuits 
So now they self-regulate and they do so in a way that is far more effective than any of the regulations that government created because now instead of being primarily concerned about complying with the letter of the law as cheaply as possible, instead they're concerned about actually stopping the damage from happening so they don't lose everything. That is how we make government smaller and get it out of the way and empower you to go after the people who are actually doing damage to you. Thank you. And then, a question. It wasn't a question or uh, an awareness to an issue that I would like to bring up. I do work in the tourism industry that has allowed me to work with many J1 students. J1 students. Yes. Does allow me to come here, repeat and slump to be taxed heavily at oftentimes a scam. below minimum yep. wage. Mm -hmm. And then they are shuffled out of the country yep. before they can even apply for a tax return and give you the seven It's a scam. Yes. I, and thank you for bringing it up. I live in Myrtle Beach. We have a lot of J-1 students come. For those who don't know what J-1 is, it was set up as a, as a program, as a sort of almost like a cultural explain, exchange or, uh, or educational program where students could come and learn what it's like to experience the American dream for the low, low price of about ten dollars or $20,000. They can come here and they can work and learn what it's like to be an American and take part in the American dream. And as you said, what ends up happening is there are these cartels that bring them in legally, perfectly legally, bring them in, huddle them into below minimum wage jobs where they are often subjected to not just labor abuses and, and uh, garnishment of their, uh, taking from their wages and being underpaid and they have no real ability to fight back because they don't understand their legal rights, but also they're subjected often to physical and sexual abuse. Uh, the church my wife goes to has dealt with J-1 students who have come here, thought that they were going to experience the American dreams and get those college credits back home to show that they've learned to work with Americans. They go home hating Americans because they associate Americans with being robbed and harmed and raped and threatened and then sent home. It is an absolute scumbag program and it is a way, a loophole to get around immigration laws. We end that and tell those kids, hey, you want to come here and work? Come on over. And no, you don't have to give tens of thousands of dollars to some predator. And no, you don't have to work some terrible job uh, for someone who's going to beat you or, or abuse you or rape you or, or rob your 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 rob from your your wages. They're not going to do that. And if they do try to do that, you are just as empowered as anyone else to actually do something about it because you don't have to fear deportation. And you can stay as long as you wish. And if you end up growing your own business, that's great too, because that's what our ancestors did when they came here. That's how you end the J-1 visa program. It is an absolute, and I, th I thank you for bringing that up. There's only so many things I can remember to bring up, but that is an absolute scam of a program. Uh, it has, I can talk a lot about that. There are a lot of businesses that make money bringing in people, because they get a piece of that 10,000 or 20,000. They pay the students less than the amount of money they got bringing them in, and they send them home and threaten them the whole time that they're it's a total scumbag. Thank you for bringing that up. And then you're Char Charlie, right? Yeah. Hey. Uh, so, um, 